holy, holy. Oh, yeah, my goodness. All right, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let me get my little nest set up up here so we can kind of get, get going today. I know that uh, those of you that are that are here and you've been here every every week for you know all the for the past uh, three or four months, you know that we've been working on the Book of Revelation on Sunday morning, and it's been great to me. I mean, I I believe the Lord has used it to speak to hearts and is still using it to speak to hearts. But we've come to a portion in the book. From here on out, we're just we're just one chapter past halfway, and so the remaining part of the book of Revelation just gets more and more. Um, uh, sim, sim, uh, there are more and more symbols. There are more and more descriptions of things that need to really be understood and yeah. and um, and expanded, and, and and you don't need to rush through them and try to talk to people that probably aren't familiar with. Concepts of what you're talking about and why that's important or anything like that. So, because all of that is true, and, and really I anticipated this from the start before we even before I even started the book, is that when I got about halfway through, I was probably going to need to move that to Sunday night because uh, I can't imagine somebody who just basically comes in here on Sunday morning, just somebody coming to church because they feel the Lord would have them to come to church and they're not particularly uh, adept at knowing a lot of things about Scripture and a lot of things about things of God. And all of a sudden they come in and like last week they hear a message about uh, a woman in heaven and a dragon flying around trying to eat the child when it was born. And, uh, and it's like I can imagine them going, what in the world is that even talking about? And why would that be important to me and all of that kind of stuff? And so uh, because of that, uh, I wanted to come back on Sunday morning and kind of do some things that I think will be helpful, especially going into the holidays, because the holidays are great and wonderful, but uh, there can be complications and things that happen during this time of year because of our family, and don't try to look so spiritual. You know, like, oh, my family is wonderful, you know. Yeah. I mean, as if you never have any issues going on when your family all gets together or when you're thinking about Thanksgiving, Christmas, and, and New Year's and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, it can put a lot of stress on, on relationships and a lot of strain and so forth. So anyway, I believe the Lord has a great word for us. And uh, when I looked at the list of who signed up to be at the, at the Forever and Ever Amen marriage seminar on Sunday night, it looked like everybody in the church just about was signed up. And uh, I said, well, all right then, uh, let's, just, let's just swap it around and let's do, let's, let me do the, the marriage on Sunday morning. And it's not just marriage, it's just relationships. It's, it's any relationship that you have. And you're, I mean, you don't have to be married to benefit from the teachings that will happen over the next four weeks because they're just teachings about relationships. Thank you, Isaac, with men. Everybody give Isaac a hand. He's our main media. There goes about, about probably 70, 75% of our media partner right there. <laughs> and uh, the rest are great, and, uh, but he's kind of our anchor man of the media stuff. And, uh, but anyway, um, uh, so I, I'll back to what I was saying about relationships. It's not just for married people. It's, it, it's about any relationship that you have with members of the opposite sex, whether it's at your work or whether it's your friends or your neighbors or your family or anything. I mean, if you have any kind of relationship with somebody from the opposite sex, do you really understand them? No, as a matter of fact, the, the statement through life is uh, men, whew, women, can't live with them, can't live without them. And um, all that is just saying is uh, we as men, we just don't understand women. What makes them the way they are and why do they act that way and think that way? And, and women, you have the same effect basically as men. Men can't live with them, can't shoot them, you know. So anyway, yeah. so anyway you, you're, you're basically saying how can I understand life from a man's point of view because if, you, if he can understand your point of view, you can understand his point of view, you know what he needs, he knows what you need, then relationships can be better. And so we're going to spend about four weeks on that, those kind of things starting next Sunday morning. So we'll do that. And then on Sunday night, starting tonight, uh, you come at 6, and I'm going to get into the book of Revelation, and we're going to take our time, and we're going to 
We're going to expand it so you can really understand what's going on and you can ask questions and we can be here and not be so just rushed to try to hurry up and run through things. Uh, last Sunday, I noticed that when I was teaching chapter 12 last Sunday, it was about, you remember, the, the woman, the war, and the woe. And uh, when I started reading all that scripture, I'm sitting here thinking in my mind, my goodness, man, are they even... Is this even making any kind of sense? And I'm having to rush through and try to, you know, because I don't want to get bogged down in it. And anyway, uh, I hope that'll be suitable for you and that you'll be able to come back if you, uh, if you really are interested in that and, and want to get a, be a part of that. And today, all right, now today, we're just, I, I have just kind of a, like a transition word for you because uh, I believe the Lord is speaking to my heart. I don't know about you, but... Uh, sometimes I can get disappointed and discouraged in life because things don't work out like I think they ought to. Things don't happen like I plan for them to happen. Uh, life looks different than I would expect it to look, especially being a Christian because we Christians anticipate that God is going to bless our lives and work in our lives and and, and, and there's a benefit to being a child of God. And usually when life doesn't happen like we think it should happen, we begin to, to look at ourselves, and the first thing we begin to do is we begin to ask ourselves, is God punishing me? Our first impulse, I mean, human beings are, I guess, born with a nature that the first thing that happens is we begin to feel guilty about stuff. And so when things start happening that don't seem to be blessed or we get discouraged or disappointed, we begin to ask ourselves, well, is, is it because God is angry with me? Is this a punishment? You know, am I, am I, not, am I out of God's purpose? Have I missed God's will? Have I, am I involved in living a life that God's not pleased with? And we begin to condemn ourselves and criticize ourselves. And, um, and, and of course, then we begin to put ourselves in a shell and, and, and we begin to avoid spiritual things and we quit coming to church and we quit reading our Bible and we quit praying because, just frankly, uh, this, this interaction with God in any way becomes very uncomfortable because you're really angry with him. You really, you're really saying to God, you let me down. Yeah. I mean, I, I gave up everything for you. I, 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 I do everything you want me to. I put myself in this position. I've, I've set myself at odds with the, with the king and with the law and with my family. And I've given up everything to serve you. And I've given my whole life. And what do I get out of it? Nothing. When I need you, you don't show up. When, when I depend on you, you don't come through. And so we have that relationship with God that is very discouraging and very disappointing. And if you live long enough, and I know that's not a good motivating statement, all right? You know, in, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the pantheon of motivating statements, if you live long enough, would be way down here at the bottom <laughs> to try to motivate somebody. But I, I don't really know a better way to say it at the moment. I'm just going to say, if you live long enough, you are going to have this kind of feeling in life. There, if you live long enough, there is, there, there is coming a time where you're going to be disappointed and discouraged. And you're going to think you're getting a raw deal from God and that God is a thousand miles away and he doesn't care about you or know about you. So what do you do in times like that? How do you look at times like that? Does God have anything in his word that will tell us how we can respond in times like that? And what is he doing in times like that? If he's not punishing me, what is he doing? If this is not, if this is not a, a curse from God, what is it? How can I look at this in any way but a punishment from God? Well, you might be happy to know that there's a wonderful story in the Scripture that illustrates this just exactly like you're probably feeling it. And there's a wonderful man of God who had this same kind of event happen to him. Mike, Mike said Job, and, and certainly Job could be it. 
but I'm thinking about the prophet Elijah. You've heard of the prophet Elijah? Elijah was really a great man of God. He had a protege that had a name very similar to his. It was Elisha. I've said before, when I get to heaven, I think, you know, the one thing <laughs> that I might, uh, might, you know, bring up up there, uh, you know, I've told you, 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 you think you're going to ask a lot of questions when you get to heaven, but according to 1 Corinthians, you're going to know as you are known. In other words, when I get to heaven, I'm going to know everything. How, what does God know about you? He knows everything. When you get to heaven, if Corinthians said you are going to know as you are known, in other words, you're going to know when you get to heaven the way God knows you now. Well, that means you're going to know everything when you get to heaven, so you're not going to have to ask any questions because you're already going to know the answer. But I think one thing I will ask when I get there is, God, why didn't you name these two guys a little bit different, like one's Elijah and the other could be Joe or something? You know what I mean? Come on. Because it gets kind of cloudy on Elisha and Elijah. Well, Elijah was a... Elijah was a great man of God, and God used Elijah in some tremendously powerful ways. He put him in some really terrible situations at a terrible time in life. And one of those situations happens in the book of 1 Kings in chapter 16. And let, let, let's just start and, and let's look. In the, in the 38th year of King Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. So everybody say, he was a wicked dude. He was a wicked, he did more evil against the Lord, this king, than any man that has ever come. So I think we could say easily, that Ahab was president of the heathen club, all right? So his, this guy is a, is, is, a, is a betrayer of God. He doesn't lead the people toward God. He's the king of Israel, but he's just leading them away from God. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now, that's just, uh, if you don't, you probably don't know Jeroboam, but Jeroboam was a leader, was a king back before Ahab, and he led Israel away from God, and he led them to worship idols, and he led them to change holy days and, and change Jerusalem and move the, the, the celebration to Gilead and some other places outside where God said. In other words, he just led the people to disregard the things that God had set up, and so that's uh, Jeroboam. And so here's Ahab, and the Bible's saying about Ahab that he just kind of followed in that trend of not uh, taking seriously the things of God and dishonoring God in every way. And he's the president of the heathen club. And notice that he took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So if Ahab is the president of the heathen's club, he marries Jezebel, the vice president of the heathen club. Jezebel was a wicked woman. Jezebel did everything to incite Ahab to be far more wicked than he would have been without her. So they are leading now, and they're taking Israel, and they're leading them astray, and they're worshiping idols, and this is not what God wants. In verse 32, then he set up an altar for Baal and the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. That's a no-no. And Ahab made a wooden image. And Ahab, look at this description. Would you like to have this description about your life? And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Oh, what a, what a testimony, right? Man, this guy was, according to the Spirit of God, was the worst of all of the kings that had ever led Israel. And he did more to provoke God's anger than all the rest of them put together. What a dubious distinction, right? Well, of course, God can't let this stand. This is not going to go unchallenged in life. God says, I've got to break the back of this rebellion against me. And so enter God's man. God has a man to send into this situation. He has just the one he's uh, anointed to do this. He's ordained to do this. He's put in the position, and he speaks to his man. And so in the first verse of chapter 17, enter God's man. 
And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's pretty audacious, right? I mean, to go into the presence of the king, a king who could have your head cut off or you drawn and quartered or put on a cross upside down. I mean, it's pretty audacious to walk into the presence of a king and basically say, hey, king, it ain't going to rain till I say so. Now, when you talk to a king like that, there are a couple of things that need to be true. Number one, you better make sure you are standing on the authority of God. <laughs> In other words, you better make sure that you can back up what you're saying and that God has indeed given you that word or else you're going to be a french fry somewhere. And number two, you need to be prepared is to get out of Dodge for a few days. <laughs> I mean, I would recommend if you speak to the king like this that you might have a little vacation plan to get out of his presence for, for a couple of days. And so Elijah said, it ain't going to rain till I say so. And then uh, the word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith which flows in the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and he did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and he stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook, and it happened for a while that, the brook, that after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Now, this is kind of ironic, right? I mean, he's at a place, and obviously you can see that God sent him after he spoke the word of the Lord and he challenged the king, and now God says, all right, I'm going to take you away from here so uh, he's not going to be able to get to you. And in other words, we're going to kind of hide you out down here because you've spoken my word, and you need to be out of his presence, so I'm going to take care of you. So I want you to go down to the brook Cherith, and I want you to just stay there, and you're going to be able to drink from the brook. You're going to have plenty of fresh water and just drink from this brook, this wonderful, clean, clear, crystal brook. And then in the morning, uh, just lean back and lean your head back and open your mouth, and I'm going to send the ravens to bring you meat in the morning. And so Elijah could just lean back, open his mouth, and just the ravens would drop the meat. And then every afternoon about 6 p.m. or so, he would just lean back and he would drop the meat, you know. And, and here comes a raven, and they would feed him in the morning and the evening. He'd drink from the brook. I mean, this is a very comfortable man. This is a man that has his needs met every day. But then all of a sudden, this wonderful, beautiful, bubbling brook that brings life, all of a sudden becomes a parched, dried, dried up uh, 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 creek bed. In other words, his brook dries up. If you wanted to put a subtitle on, on this word, it would be, what do you do when your brook dries up? Because sooner or later in life, your brook's going to dry up. You're going to have a brook, a wonderful, comfortable something that you depend on, you trust in, you believe in. It's a source of blessing. It's a source of life. It's a source of enjoyment. It's a source of you know, victory in life. And it's going to be a wonderful example of how you have God's favor and you're going to trust it and depend on it and you're going to become uh, enamored with it. And then all of a sudden, the brook's going to dry up. And that which you trusted in is going to become that which now uh, 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 tortures you. What happened to your brook? You live long enough. You live life enough. You're going to have some brook that, draw, that, that dries up. Somebody's going to die. Something's going to change. You're going to lose a job. You're, uh, you're not going to be able to pay your bills. Somebody's going to come in and out of your life. Uh, just all of these different characteristics of what causes your brook to dry up. It is ironic here that the brook dries up because Elijah says it ain't going to rain till I say so. <laughs> In other words, the reason the brook runs dry, which he's depending on, is because he hadn't said rain again. He calls his brook to dry up. I mean, you know, you do see that, right? 
She dries up because it had been no rain for all of these three and a half years, by the way, is how long it lasts. I don't know, you might just be interested in knowing how long. Three and a half years, long time, no rain, right? <laughs> well, God had to break the back of this heathen pagan worship. God had, to, God had to challenge it. And so God's man speaks the word, and he goes down by the brook. He's comfortable, comfortable he's wonderful. Everything's great until all of a sudden his brook dries up. Well, what's the problem here? I mean, Elijah is God's man, right? Elijah is, is where God said to go, right? He's in the will of God, doing the purpose of God. He's obeying God in every way. He's done exactly what God said, and yet here he is with a dried up brook in life. His brook has run dry. He, he's discouraged. He's disappointed. He's questioning. And probably his first question is the same question that all of us ask when we face these kind of disappointments in life, and that is, is God mad at me, and why is God doing this to me, and how can I please God again? And that's what we begin to think about. But let me suggest three things that can replace that, oh God, Am I in the wrong place at the wrong time, doing the wrong thing? Am I displeasing you? Is this a punishment? Do I need to change? Let me give you three other suggestions as to what might be happening when your brook dries up. Number one would be God might be trying to liberate you. And by liberate, I mean, I know you understand the English language, but by liberate, I mean something has a hold of you that you need to be free from. You know, it's really easy to get enamored with the brook, right? It's really easy to enjoy the brook so much that you forget the one who sent the brook. Because possessions and things are so easy for us to get to latch on to. And it's a wonderful thing to have possessions and things. And there's nothing wrong with having a beautiful home, nice automobiles, uh, cable TV, cell phones, uh, wonderful things in life and these uh, great uh, tools and opportunities. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having possessions. But what goes wrong is when possessions have you. And it's so easy as human beings for us to allow those things to become uh, obsessive in life. And when that happens, then we, then we begin to, to forget the God who brings those things into our life. So one of the things that might be happening when your brook dries up is God allows the brook to dry up because the brook has become too important in your life. And he has become less appointed in life. Do you know before God can take you forward, he's got to break you from your past. Do you realize this? I mean, you're not going to go forward until you get loosed from what's behind. Now, I can testify this to you mightily. <laughs> I really can. I've, I can say to you that two or three times in my life, I have had to have God blow me out of somewhere in order to be somewhere else. One of the things Pastor Tanya and I say to each other is, uh, let's don't make God blow us out of anywhere else, okay? <laughs> let's listen to him and just do what he says and instead of him having to make our brook dry up and <laughs> blow us out of there because that's not comfortable at all. I guarantee you it's not. But I'm just saying to you that when this happens, it may be God trying to, to, to break the captivity that you have to something that instead of you having it, it has you. It's kind of like, you know, you've heard me talk about the fly, tangle foot flypaper, right? Matter of fact, Holly, you, got, you just have some tangle foot on the back porch, if I'm not mistaken. You've seen tangle foot flypaper? I know some of you modern contemporary folks that, that didn't grow up out in the country with little country stores. You probably have never even seen any tangle foot flypaper. Tanglefoot is that, is that little uh, sticky strip that usually is tacked up to a, you know, a little cross member or ceiling brace or whatever, and it hangs down about you know, so long, and it's just a sticky little film that kind of spirals here, and it's got this little bucket, this little, little placement, little bucket on the bottom of it, 
where you pulled it out of. And it kind of kind of weighs it down and keeps it, you know, straight up and down. And when it blows in the breeze, it just keeps it from tangling back up. It just holds it straight. And and that's tangle foot fly paper because what that paper is is it's so sticky on both sides that if something runs into it, a gnat, a fly, or anything else, boom, it sticks immediately, and it's gone. That's it. It's not going to leave that tangle foot. So life is a lot like this tangle foot fly paper. Possessions are like tangle foot fly paper. The old fly sees the tangle foot uh, there hanging down, and the fly is flying around going, my tangle foot, my tangle foot, my tangle foot, my tangle foot. And then he dives into the tangle foot. And then the tangle foot is saying, my fly, my <laughs> fly. Yeah, it's good to have things, but things make a horrible taskmaster because things can't produce what they advertise. If things could produce what they advertise, we would all be happy as a lark, wonderfully healthy, greatly enjoy life, and all the vitamins, all the products on TV, everything that you see is uh, enjoy life, have a greater life, buy this. Uh, this will make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. This will make your uh, heart better, your lungs better, your eyes better. This will make you a, a stronger person. You'll live to be 150 years old. This is wonderful and great. This is going to take you to the next level. I mean, e every advertising scheme is based on telling you that what you have is not enough, but if you'll get this, it'll be enough. So it might be God. Trying to, trying to liberate you from something that has hold on you that's not him. Because he has to do this before he can take you anywhere. You're far too satisfied. You, you know what I see in Elijah? I see a man who's far too comfortable. I mean, just lay your head back in the morning the birds come and drop it. Your food, the bubbling brook is there. Lay your head back. In the afternoon, the birds drop the food. I, you know what I see? I see Elijah as a man in a hammock laid back, uh, swinging in the breeze with a channel changer in one hand and a glass of water in another hand, just looking at God and saying, let those ravens come just one more time, God. Far too comfortable in life. So God might be trying to liberate you. Here's another suggestion as to what God might do might be doing. He might be leading you. How many of you understand that God doesn't normally speak to you like you think he is? Right? When you ask God for something and you say, Lord, speak to me about this, what are you expecting? You're expecting a voice out of heaven saying, this is God. Thou shalt go down to so, you know, and you shalt then turn thee to the left and goest thou to the right and turnest up and don't goest down. And I mean, out of a cloud or a, or a tree or a rock or, you know, I mean, what are, what are you expecting for an answer? Well, I'll guarantee you that most of us are expecting something, but the what we're expecting is probably not going to be the way God answers this. In order to lead you, Sometimes God has to use circumstances, right? God speaks to us by the Holy Spirit, through the Bible, through prayer, through circumstances and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. Now, God can speak any way he wants to, but the Bible makes it clear that in these days that we're living in, God uses basically four, uh, four characters to bring the word to us. One is the Bible that you read and the Bible that I preach and the word of God that you hear and the things that, that he speaks out of that word of God that help you think the right way and guide you in some way. And then God also uses 
uh, prayer, when you pray and you sense in your heart that, that something's this deep inside of you and, and, and people, you can't even identify it, but you just know it's there and it's just something that comes into you and, and you feel very close to it and very much led by it. And, and, and then God uses circumstances like, like this closing and this opening and this being available and this not being available and this changing and that moving that way. I mean, to put you, how many of you have said, God, put me at the right place at the right time? You hear about the job just when yours is closing down. It's the perfect thing. That's a circumstance that God used to take you from one place to another place. God uses circumstances all the time. And then the church means all the other Christian people in your life to speak a word to you, to pray a word, for you to hear a word, and for God to move you forward. Well, God might be leading you when your brook dries up. Because you're, no, you're going nowhere until the brook dries up. Because you're not looking for anything else. It's comfortable where you are. There's no reason to change. So God says, well, let me dry this brook up because I've got another place for you to be. And so God dries the brook up, and Elijah now is cast out from the brook because he's got to go somewhere else. Do you know that this brook, this brook scene here is not what we even remember about Elijah? Am I right about this? See, if Elijah had stopped at the brook, we would have never heard about some of the real things we remember Elijah for. You say, what do, what, what do you remember? Well, we remember what happens next. This is just the start of something that basically launches the career, so to speak, of one of the greatest men of God that's ever been on this earth. But had he stopped at the brook, we would have never heard about anything, and we, wouldn't even, we, we don't even know him for this little brook deal. How many of you, before I read this passage, even remembered this about Elijah, that he went down to a brook and he you know, was led by God? Do you remember anything about that? But you do remember what happens next, right? In chapter 18, this is chapter 17, in chapter 18, Elijah walks out and stands before God and the prophets of Baal and says, uh, all right, it's time for God to have a service. And these guys have been at it all morning. We gave them the first service. And these 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the grove have called on Baal to send fire down from heaven and consume their sacrifice. And I think we've given them enough time. And I think we gave them the early service. And now it's time for the second service to start. So I'm going to move that over. Guys, bring some water. Yeah, bring 55-gallon drums of water. Pour about five on them. And they pour and they pour and they pour, and the Bible says in the trench around the sacrifice, the water just piles up, so the water's standing in the trench. I mean, there's not going to be any spontaneous combustion about this deal. And then Elijah says about 31 words in the English language. 31 words. These guys have been chanting and chiming and begging and pleading to this uh, idol Baal to send fire and consume the sacrifice all morning. It's noon. And Elijah says, fill up the trenches. And, and then he looks at God and he says, God, because I'm your man, these people need to know I'm your man. I want you to send fire down and, and, and be the God of Israel down. And the Bible says that fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice and licked up all the water out of the trenches. And Elijah said, all right, off with their heads. And they killed the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the grove. Woo! See, if Elijah was still sitting at the brook, that would have never happened. And then you know what happens next. Yeah, you remember this story. He goes, when he leaves, when he leaves uh, that, that confrontation, he goes to a, a, a little city, and God says, when you go in there, you're going to find this, this woman. She's a widow, and she's going to be picking up sticks, and you're going to say, you're going to ask her to make you a cake. And when he gets in the city, there's the woman picking up sticks, and he says, uh, uh, what you doing? And then she said, well, I'm going to pick up these sticks, and I'm going to go make my, I'm going to get a, a little, little meal and a little oil that I have, and I'm going to make a cake, and then me and my son are going to die. Because that's all the food we have. And Elijah said, uh, make me one first. 
And I know when you read that story, you think, man, the audacity of him. Is he that selfish? No, he's the man of God. And Elijah was basically saying, make God a, pea, make God a little cake first. Let's see, let's see if you will honor God first before you think about yourself. I'm the man of God. I stand in the place of God, so make me one first. And she did it. And because she did it, he looks at her and he says, I'm going to tell you what, now go make you, a cake, you and your boy a cake. And the cruise of oil never ran out of oil. And the barrel of meal never ran out of meal. For the rest of their lives, all she had to do was go over and pour the oil out of the cruise. I, I don't know what it looked like. I'm not... The Bible doesn't say it was running over. It, it just says that it never ran out. Right. And the meal barrel, it doesn't say that the barrel ran over. It just said it didn't run out. We want the barrels and the crews to run over, right? Because then we can be comfortable. Because we can look at our, our oil and our meal and we can say, got it made for years. Bless God and be happy. And just, we're not nervous anymore. We're not anxious anymore. We just got, whoo, we got the world by a tail on a downhill pool. I mean, we're just awesome. Because we like to be comfortable, right? So we can forget the one who sends the blessing. We love the blessing and we forget the one who sends the blessing. But every time we look at that barrel, we don't see anything running over. We've just got to have faith that when we pull that top off and stick that hand down in there, there will be some meal down in the barrel. We've got to trust God every time. That's what we remember Elijah for. And then we remember what happens next. The woman's son dies. And Elijah said, she said, my son's dead. He said, give him to me. And, and he took him and he took him upstairs to the little bedroom and he laid him on the bed. And then he covered over him three different times and asked God to bless him. And <coughs> the boy come back to life. Right there, man. Elijah. But that's still, we know more about Elijah because it was Elijah that had the little protege, Elisha. And what, you remember what the protege, you remember what Elisha prayed? Elisha was following Elijah around. It became apparent that Elijah was about to be called to heaven by God. And he had this mantle. He had this cloak that he carried with him that represented the call of God. And so he would take his little cloak and Elijah would. And he would touch the Jordan River. And the Jordan River would just part right down like the, like the Red Sea. Because the power of God was in the mantle of the man of God. And then Elijah saw that. And Elijah said, God, when you take Elijah away God, give me a double portion of everything you've given Elisha. He prayed for twice as much power, twice as much usability, twice as much example to this world as Elijah had. And you remember what Elijah said to him? If you're here when I go up, you're going to get that. In other words, if you'll stick with me and won't leave and you'll be there when you see what God does with me, God's going to give you everything you need. But if you're a quitter and you walk away, you're not going to see it and you're not going to get it. And sure enough, Elijah, uh, Elisha saw it. And the mantle, and, and God came down in a chariot of fire. You remember the story? And just swooped Elijah up. Elijah didn't die. He just got swooped up in a chariot of fire and his mantle just kind of fell down like this. And Elijah and Elisha picked it up and the big question was, is this thing still the power of God? Will God feel this thing for me like he filled it for Elijah? And he went over and he touched the Jordan River and when he did, the Jordan River split like the Red Sea. And Elisha, walked with twice the power of Elijah. I'm just saying to you that when God dries up your brook, it may be because he's trying to liberate you, and it may be because he's trying to lead you. He has somewhere else for you to be. He has something else for you to do. And he can't use you 
until he gets you where he wants you. Here's the next instruction. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, okay, so he's down there, the book drives up, and here's the word of the Lord. Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. I, I just want to call your attention to something in the verses. You know, a lot of times the way verses are worded can give you a little indication of, of what we're talking about here. Notice the, notice the word there, T-H-E-R-E. Notice there. He says, arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. And notice, see, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. What is that saying to us? It's saying the place of God's leadership is the place of God's blessing. The blessing is going to be there. Where are you going to be? The blessing is going to show up there. And if you're not there, you're not going to get the blessing. So what is that saying to us? It's saying, listen, God might be lifting me to something far better than what I have. So instead of getting down and out and mullying and grubbing and displeasing God and griping and complaining and feeling like God doesn't love you anymore, oh God, I've given my whole life for you. I've given my offerings. I go to church. I sing in the, in the band. I play instruments. I sacrifice. I work in the nursery. I do the children's work. I, do, I mean, you just go down this litany of stuff you are and then look at God and blame, basically uh, blame him for mismanagement. Look at all I've given to you, God, and what do I get? Nothing. I'm just saying there's a different way. To, there's a better way and a different way to look at this. Because God might be lifting you for something far better than what you have now. Notice, when Elijah was spoken by God, he said, go down to the, go down to the brook Cherith and stay there, and I'm going to send the ravens to feed you there. What is a raven? <laughs> a raven's a crow. You know, a crow's a scavenger, right? He's a baby buzzard. Did you know this? Crows will eat anything, nasty things, dead things, just like a buzzard. And so I'm thinking, you know, what were they bringing to Elijah? I mean, really, you see, the crows brought it, and I'm thinking, okay, crows can't cook. So they, were they bringing old nasty dead meat and giving it to Elijah and dropping it in his mouth. And, you know. All right, it could keep you alive, but how enjoyable would that be? Nah. nah. And yet, and here's God. God says, all right, your brook dried up. Now, I want you to go to a city, Zarephath, and I've got a widow who cooks really good and who has a spirit of hospitality and will take care of you. And you'll have a comfortable bed to lie in, a comfortable house to be in. And you're going to get three square meals a day fixed by a woman that God has blessed to be able to meet those needs in your life. Tell me which one you would prefer. Two, two meals a day from a buzzard or three squares from a woman of God who has been blessed by God to take care of the needs of your life. See, God might be lifting you to something much better. I just submit to you that many times God has to break you away from things that are far less than what he wants for you. Far less uh, 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 for what he has for you. And the only way that he can lead you forward is to break you free from what has come before. So when your brook dries up, when things don't look just right, instead of immediately falling under some delusion of conviction and anxiety and, oh, God, you're you know, killing me and I'm sorry I didn't, you know. Now, if you have been disobedient and you are, <laughs> you know, your life is full of disobedience, I'm not saying you ought not check that first, but... 
But when that checks out and you're being as obedient as you can and you're trying to follow God as much as you can and you believe you're where God wants you to be, look to these other things because that might be God's way of liberating you, of leading you and lifting you to something much better than that because God loves you. God believes in you. God's not looking for a reason to punish you. God's looking for a way to bless your life. You have to know this. And God will do it in your life every time. Would you stand to your feet, please?